Hi, everyone, and thank you very much for being with us, those of you who are physically present, but also to our online audience. So today we have with us three educators who have all experience of, let's say, conventional teaching, but life led them to different educational paths. So we're going to discuss what is education for, how to approach children, and more interestingly, we're going to have a discussion on what are some good practices or not good practices, or what has gone good or bad in the last years, decades in education. So we've got Gareth Stardy. Gareth is a curriculum advisor in education. I've got Lisa Van Damme from Van Damme Academy. And I've got Joanna Williams. Joanna is the head of the CEO, oh no, KEO think tank also. She's writing for Spiked and also she's an author. Her last book is Women versus Feminism. And there's a new one which you're gonna hear soon more about. So without further delay, this is not going to be a session where we're gonna have introductory speeches. I'm going to be throwing some topics on the panel and we're going to have what in Battle of Ideas we call how to round, round table discussion. And our online viewers, you can ask questions via Super Chat. And of course, our audience, you can ask questions at, uh, at some point in the discussion. So let's just start this way. So what have, I have found very interesting when teaching first year university students, and I'll explain how this relates to school, that in the last year, I focused most of my energy teaching them skills, but skills that you would expect that someone would have in school such as, for example, how to uh, do paragraphs in an essay, or what's the point of an introduction and main part of a conclusion. So what are the things that the kids mostly learn in schools? It's probably not skills, because we hear more and more about how kids who finish school lack some of these main skills. So the usual discussion is which of the three S's is it? Skills, subject like the curriculum, the Western canon, I'm not very sure that this is also very big in university these days, or is it socialization? So from your experience in education these days, what is the focus in terms of what are the kids expected to get, and do they get it? So who wants to start? So um, I, you people would not have heard me say this before we started, but I said I wasn't going to talk about my daughter. <laughs> so I'm immediately going to talk about my daughter, who is 15 and currently studying for her GCSEs. And I think if I didn't have my daughter, I think I would have been very cynical about your question. And I would have said, oh, it's all just socialization. There's nothing um, that they're learning that's remotely interesting. And been incredibly scathing about state schools, the national curriculum, um, um, all the rest of it. Actually, my daughter is working incredibly hard, if you're watching, <laughs> I'm pleased to say. And she has an enormous amount of content that she has to learn. Um, she's doing kind of nine GCSEs and kind of chemistry, physics, biology, all the usual subjects. And she seems to have a mountain of facts, essentially, that she has to memorize and so I, I don't think it's true to say that there's not a focus on subject content I think the thing I do notice and does worry me is that there's clearly a huge body of, of content for them to imbibe but it's how this is treated by the teachers it seems to be um very instrumental so if you ask my daughter why are you learning this why are you learning I don't know I don't even know what she is learning but but various kind of parts of chemistry and biology etc she's learning it to pass the exam and she's absolutely clear that the point of this exercise is she's going to work incredibly hard do all jump through all the hoops that's put in that are put in front of her and the aim is to pass the exam. And that upsets me because I would far rather, she was talking about because she was interested in it, because she um, thought it was worthwhile in and of itself. And I think that that ends up becoming, by the back door, a form of socialization. So it's not an, in, in, it's not an explicit form of socialization, but that um, instrumentalization of knowledge becomes a way of um, almost 
turning learning into a process of compliance, of intellectual compliance, that you're going to learn a certain number of facts in order to comply with procedures X, Y, and Z for this particular outcome. And it worries me that at the age of 15, that's the lesson that's being imbibed. So you are receiving students and discovering that they are unskilled, and everybody is observing that. And I think, ironically, the consequence is that some educators are looking backwards and saying, OK, what we need to do then is focus on teaching them skills. And they teach them skills in this sort of abstracted way away from content. So then I think what happens is we end up in a, with a false dichotomy in education. You either have the schools that drill them in facts that are very memorization oriented, that are very rigorous in the sense of demanding lots of work and lots of preparation for exams, but there isn't that integrated, rich, purposeful, deep understanding of the meaning and purpose of the subject. Um, so that's one kind of axis that you have. And then I usually feel equally suspicious of those who say, we are instead going to give the children's agency, children agency, we're going to give them choice instead of having them be you know, forced through this dreary memorization process without purpose. We're going to um, even just teach them skills. Skills, I'm going to teach them skills is a red flag for me about the not not when you say it, when I understand, <laughs> understand your purpose. Um, so I'd, I'd love for us to talk, uh, give examples of what happens when that, when because we discover they're unskilled, skills becomes the focus in schools because truly the only way I think to become a person with these skills in a meaningful way is to take them through rich, meaningful, deep, long-term sustained intellectual effort in, the, in a variety of, I've taken to using the word intellectual disciplines, which is something I've borrowed from Arthur Bester, but intellectual disciplines in each of these kind of traditional subject areas, I think most of them are not traditional just for the sake of tradition, it's that there's been a whole intellectual discipline that has developed around that field. So what you learn in studying physics is different from what you learn in studying literature or what you learn in studying history. And you learn a different way of approaching the world and, and thinking clearly. But so the fundamental skill, I think, is reason, being able to think clearly and um, precisely. But your daughter's memorization uh, approach that's that they're forcing upon her that's not going to do it but nor is abstracting skills away from the mastery of those intellectual disciplines so you probably have your own thing to say but I'm going to ask you to <laughs> um, because my introduction to Gareth was an article I read called carrot gate which I think I think really connects to this topic um, I don't know if it's too long ago for you to recall. No. Okay, okay. <laughs> Ca carrot gate. Okay, so this is probably f five, six years ago, perhaps even more than that now. C carrot gate. I don't know if any of you remember carrot gate. Anyone remember carrot gate? This is not, I didn't coin the term, but using potatoes. And this is the story, folks. The exam question was on osmosis in carrots. And large numbers nationally, very large numbers of students came out of the exam and said, well, I've, I've now failed because the question was on carrots, not potatoes. And this is an outrage. How dare you? You've deprived me of my biology GCSE by asking the wrong question. Um, their parents took it up. They took it to the exam board and so on. You know, so I guess the point you're making is that um, is is the point that 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 Joe started with that uh, I think children are being taught how to pass exams, um, and so you've both talked about that. So where I now take this is that I don't think um, that they're really learning skills at all. There's there there, there was a um, an orthodoxy for 20, 30 years that was focused on skills that, that, that moved very much away from any kind of 
learning of facts at all and looked at uh, um, how children learn and try to give them the skills to learn so they could learn anything. Um, but that has changed. Joe's right. You know, it's very much in flux. That seems to be an orthodoxy which is, which is dying out rapidly. But the alternative to the learning of facts was always promoted as skills, but I don't think it's skills at all. And I think, therefore, we have this knowledge versus skills dichotomy, which is false. Because I think the learning of skills is, is very, very different to, to learning what I would loosely called kind of propositional knowledge and that doesn't mean that there's no propositional knowledge in learning a skill but I, I we can get into it later but I think skills involve a different kind of knowledge and a different approach to it a different I'd even go so far as to say people might disagree with me but even to go so far as to say as, as a different kind of epistemology a different way of making sense of the world and that's what skills are for me now the important thing here for me is that I think that has really dropped out. So as much as, uh, as knowledge, perhaps in the sense of the canon or something like that, that we might understand it, as much as that's become instrumentalized, actually what's going on in skills has completely dropped out. Um, and so I'm in a strange kind of position where I'd be actually arguing for the return of skills, but very, very few people understand what I mean. You either are part of that orthodoxy that used to prevail in the 1980s, 1990s, and that's not what I mean by skills at all. Or I sound to sort of pro-knowledge, pro-fact people, I sound like, you know, harking back to the progressive days of the, the 70s and 80s. So um, that's, for me, where the debate is. What do we actually mean by skills? And are we really teaching skills? And, and do we need to think rethink it again it's not just about the memorizing of, of facts okay so the next question which is a follow-up from this is the following back in the day there were two factors in let's say education the one was the family the other was school you have a good teacher you learn things or the source of getting let's say interesting information let's say you're a history geek you had one teacher who was very good at history and he would give you this, this, the, this tendency to do more on that. But now, you can find this in YouTube. You can find this everywhere. So the next question would be, let's say, actually with Lisa's case, it's not let's say because you're doing this. Let's say you have children and you are the, the, the master of the universe when it comes to what curriculum you're going to give, what is going to be the ethos of the school and everything. What is the effect that a good education educator can have on children when now children can get all these insights from everywhere except from schools? So what, how, bigger, how big or significant is the role of the teacher today? Uh, I want to hear what you have to say too. No. Um, Integration and the division of labor. That's, those are the two things that come to mind right away. So yes, you've got fragments of exceptional teaching. Well, no, inter integration, division of labor, and a personal relationship. When I, lately when I try to identify the essence of what makes my school successful to whatever extent it is, I describe the success as intellectual mentorship. And that to me, encapsulates all the things that I just said. You have a person who is has a mastery of their subject, who knows how to break it down in an appropriate hierarchical way for young people, who knows how to make it motivating, how to persuade them of the value of the subject. They, have, they are a model of uh, a proper uh, they're a model of passion and enthusiasm and understanding of that subject. Hello. Can we fix that? Okay, okay. Um, so you need the relationship. You need the person to organize and integrate and give a structure to the knowledge. What was my other thing, too? <laughs> there were three. Um, yeah. 
Lab division of labor. So you need specialists in all the subject areas. So you as parent master of the universe, well, what does that mean? So the best exists out there? Are you empowered? Do you have the knowledge to judge what are the best resources out there? I, I wouldn't be able to determine what's the best physics curriculum. I'd go to Gareth. But um, so I think having uh, having specialists in their fields to deliver the content is essential, to organize and deliver the content. And that's why I teach literature and literature only and hire people to teach within their subject areas, even from the from seven years old and up. Yeah, I like that. That's why I love what you do. Um, there's, there's a lot of talk, a lot of talk at the moment about the role of cognitive science in teaching. And the model of a good teacher is becoming the person who has absorbed that cognitive science and can roll it out effortlessly. You know, a whole box of tricks. Um, I completely disagree with that. Uh, that's not to say I don't find anything of value in cognitive science, um, but I just don't think that's the model of the teacher. I, I take the following view, that I think teaching is very much an art. I do not think it's a science. And I, I've thought a lot about this, and um, if I could just drop Aristotle into the conversation for a second... Uh, Aristotle says that the foundation of all art is mimesis, right, a technical term, but es essentially, uh, you know, mimesis gives us the word mime and impersonate and so on. So, uh, so an impersonation of something, a, a, almost like a copying, but not a direct copying, a, a kind of inhabiting another spirit, really. And I absolutely think that that's what a teacher's job is to do, a teacher needs to personify the subject to such a power and degree that anyone with the privilege of, of watching this person over a sustained amount of time not only gets completely won over by it, that they make whatever their subject is so absorbing and so interesting and so fascinating and compelling that you just watch them and think, I want to be like that. Now, you can't really, I mean, you, you can analyze it for the purpose of discussing it, but when you're doing it, when that transaction, that transmission is actually taking place, I don't think you can really say too clearly what's going on in that, in that process, other than you're doing a whole range of things that the person on the receiving end of it is drawn by, drawn out of themselves, into something else, they begin to inhabit that, and then before they know it, they are that. And that's the best way that I think you can approach teaching. No, I, I agree and have very little to add really to um, what both Gareth and Lisa have said. I guess the only thing I would follow up that with Gareth is, um, I think exactly the same applies in the home as well and in relation to parents. Um, but I, I totally agree with what Lisa's saying. I'm not for one second going to pretend to become a chemistry subject specialist or a specialist in biology or physics or anything like that. But I, I think what um, children can perhaps gain from the home environment is a broader modeling of a relationship in relation to knowledge. Um, if, if parents are reading model or anything like that, I'd probably faint with shock if they did. But I think the fact that they will, they are avid readers and um, they've clearly kind of imbibed an environment where these kind of things are important to be respected irrespective of spe uh, specific subject knowledge. Um, so I think that's the case. But I totally agree with what Lisa was saying about the, the fundamental importance of teaching as a relationship. And it's because of that, Nikos, I've got to say, I actually fundamentally disagree with the premise of your question. I don't think any YouTube star, no matter how brilliant, um, can ever, ever replicate. You know, the, the, I think the very best YouTube star would perhaps come up to the most mediocre classroom teacher because it's an entirely different relationship. When you watch something on YouTube, you are passive. 
even with a mediocre teacher, you're having to engage in some way, even if it's for older pupils, perhaps having to think, why is this person annoying me? <laughs> why is this person wrong in what they're saying? You know, you, there's, ha there's a much more active intellectual process of engagement going on other than just a, a passive on-screen um, viewing. I, I think the two things are so fundamentally different. You know, that I wouldn't describe watching a YouTube um, performer as, as an educator, or as an educational experience. It might be entertaining, but I wouldn't describe it as education. Can I just pass in? Yes, and then I have one second. Just, just briefly, that I mean, I totally agree, Joe, that um, it's books. You know, so much of it is books. In terms of what goes on in the home, um, you know, how parents engage with, with knowledge is obviously bigger than just books, but books are so, so important. And if, if there is some sort of culture of books in the home, and I don't really much mind what kind of books, you know? Um, but if they're a thing in the home, um, I think that accounts for so much. And, and that's why I think it, that is very different to YouTube. Very different. If you think about the relationship you might have with books in the home, let's you know think about when you were a small child, and if you were lucky enough to have a home that had books in them, what was your relation to that? Was that the same kind of relation you had to YouTube? I just do not think so. Um, and so, re you know, if you had to put it in one word, reading, I think is the word. I just wanted to add that I recall having a conversation with Gareth and Joanna near the start of the pandemic when we were doing all of our teaching online. And I was describing that uh, while it was a success largely for me to teach my students online and much better than the alternative of not teaching them at all, which is what a lot of students went through. Um, and I could capitalize on the pre-existing relationship I had with them so they were pretty engaged and and focused and participatory online, it still felt so fundamentally different. And it felt like it took a lot more energy from me. It felt like they were engaged, but not nearly as engaged as they were when we were in person. And I recall bringing this issue up with Joanna and Gareth, and I don't remember which of them pointed out to me something that seems painfully obvious in retrospect, but they just said, you can't make eye contact with somebody on, on the screen. And I, in a sense, felt like I was making eye contact with them because I was looking at all of them and I could see their faces, but at no point ever can you sincerely make eye contact with them. And this just goes back to my understanding now of that the importance of that relationship and that mentorship, that there's a human element to this you know, you say it's hard to describe sometimes the elements, and because they can be hard to describe or they can be so instinctual to us, we can forget about them altogether. Um, but but it, it needs to be that level of engagement where I can look them in the eye and everything that just primally comes from the experience of looking someone in the eye and that also you read about them from looking in their eyes. There's so much to learn about their response to what you're saying. and. So, yeah, that, that was very helpful to me. I'm hoping we ought to get another one. Ah, no. <laughs> so, just to come back on what Lisa's saying about the importance of eye contact, which 100% totally agree with. Um, I'm, I'm really, I'm thinking, Nikos, you, your question clearly upset me, <laughs> as you can gather. Um, I'm thinking, why can anyone even ask the question? Sorry, not really, but I am thinking, why would we even ask the question about YouTube? And I think for me, one of the really, um, well, a big problem and also very, very sad uh, state of affairs in higher education uh, is the complete um, disregard that we seem to have for the lecture format nowadays. Um, that And this predates pandemic, and I think this is why lectures have been, we've been talking about this earlier, I think this is why in universities lectures were so easy to dispense with, and many universities have still not, they may have brought back face-to-face -face seminars, but haven't brought back in-person lectures. And that's because there was a, really a, a, at least a 10-year-old campaign um, where lectures have been derided as this kind of passive learning experience that if somebody's just standing at the front and talking then the students are not actively engaged and not learning 
And I think that's such a Philistine um, approach to understanding what's actually going on in a lecture. It underestimates the lecturer um, for all the reasons that Lisa was saying in terms of how you read the room, how you look and see who's engaged and, and what you, you get visible feedback from what your students are getting out of the lecture. But it also, I think, really has a very degraded view of students and the whole notion of learning because essentially what the argument is that's being put forward is that learning equals busyness. And unless you're actually kind of performing, i.e. you're actually talking or you're drawing or you're creating some kind of chart or collage, kind of the more wacky and the more busy, the better, but completely devoid often of any intellectual content. And I think because we've had that utter degradation of the lecture, it became very easy then to just say, well, these things are completely dispensable. And then the next step along that is it becomes easy to just say, well, we can just get any old kind of, I know this is not what you were saying, but just get any kind of YouTube person to replicate this experience. So I kind of think um, we really need a campaign to make, well, maybe not a campaign, but we need to gather the intellectual arguments about why the lecture format is, is along with reading, something very a valuable um, resource and, and has been, we know, for, for centuries. This is a way that people have communicated knowledge. And if it was good enough for the ancient Greeks, you know, why shouldn't it be good enough for people today? Well, the baby has been thrown out with the bathwater, right? Because um, it is true that there have probably been a great number of incredibly boring lectures that, <laughs> that children have been subjected to. And it does, a, a lecture to be a successful lecture requires earnest passion on the part of the teacher. It requires that they be able to communicate the content of, of what they're teaching and their passion to young minds. Um, it, it, there are a lot of things that make a lecture successful. And the, f the, f the further we are away from generations of people who have experienced successful lectures or given successful <laughs> lectures themselves, the more we sort of throw that out as a possible uh, educational platform. But so what's happening instead, I think, and now bring my pet peeve into this, is we talk instead about um, introducing choice into the curriculum and having children drive and motivate their own education. And that, I think, is disastrous. And if we have time, I'd like to hear what people have to say about that. So this, is a, this is brings me exactly to the next topic. Because when you think about inspirational teachers, how many of you have watched the Dead Poet Society? OK, so in my generation, it was supposed to be the coolest kind of the teacher we all want to have. So I remember circa 2011, when I was you know, kind of predictable, boring leftist. I posted on YouTube that video with Robin Williams from Dead Poets Society, where he says, gentlemen, tear that page from that book. And I thought, you know, I'm super radical. And a person, a common friend of mine, and Joanna, told me, uh, you know, this is now the establishment. Like, this is not the radical thing anymore. This is like old news. This is now the thing that we need to overcome. This idea that the child has authority. Now, I have to say that every time I watch Dead Poets Society, I always get very moved and I think this is okay. This teacher is indeed great. But the question is to put it in very simple terms. Has the pendulum went to a place where now, as, so students are not students. They are how it's called, uh, co-learners that we all together participate in this process of learning. So is there a merit to it, or is there a merit and we've pushed it too far, or we should never go to that direction? So Robin Williams in Dead Poets Society, victim, a villain or hero? <laughs> so he lost his job. Well, I, I, did he lose his job with good reason? Didn't didn't one of his students shoot themselves? Yeah, but <laughs> you know, so one of his students shot themselves. You know, and he was implicated in that, he and uh, and, uh, and he you know, he lost his job. So I don't know if he really was a good teacher. Now, the the what I found is that people look to that story as a model for how to be a teacher. 
and and now we're seeing a, a strange period where there's a bit of a backlash to that, but people are still sort of using it as some sort of benchmark for for being a, a, a teacher. The same with the history boys to a, a certain extent. If you're a bit more sort of guardian reading and intellectual, you'll you'll probably turn to the history boys. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a great movie. I love it. Um, I was just talking about it to my son the other day. Actually, he hasn't seen it yet. Um, but I, I think it speaks to the fact that teachers don't have a clear idea of what they should be doing. Because if you're, if you're a, I think if you're a teacher worth your salt, you do exactly what I've done, which is you take a position on Keating. You either go, yeah, I think that's great for the following reasons, and there's reasons to like him, or you don't like him. You know, I just recommend if you if you're not very long in teaching, go into a room and tell them all to tear the front page out of their textbook and, you know, see how far you get. I, I always remember a colleague of mine, you know, sitting there saying, um, well, look, kids, if, if you don't want to go here, just be here, just, just go. Just go then. And so they all did. And he just, <laughs> they all left. And he was terrified that they were never going to come back. Um, so you can try all those things, but, you know, life's more complicated. And teaching is more complicated. I can see Joe's itching to get in. So, um, I think the, I, I just wanted to pick up as well on, on something you, you were just saying about the lecture. I think the lecture has fallen into disrepute. And you're right, the, the students are expected to be busy and talking to one another and learning from one another and all of that. But by the same token, um, any, anything that is to do with practical knowledge is also now falling into disrepute so yeah they might be sort of drawing posters and things but if you look at practical science very little practical science being done in our in our science lessons these days um it, it, things like music and so on sub, subjects that require you to 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 be practically active in in a very disciplined way it's on the slide down um even in things like geography and so on in in terms of getting out there in the field it's just seen as something that is, is too difficult to manage. I'll move on. But uh, I, I think it's not just the kind of cognitive lecture thing. There's also another type of knowledge which is also disappearing. And what's left is just chat to your, chat to your neighbour about it, write down some facts, and we'll, we'll move on and tell you how to pass the exam. So my uh, teaching secondary school English was my first job after leaving university. And I really enjoyed it. I had complete passion for what I was doing. I uh, moved, I was, so yeah, this is a long time ago now. <laughs> I'm very old and we're talking many, many years ago. And the, uh, at the start of my teaching career, the national curriculum was already fully, fully established. And that was part and parcel of school life. And it felt as if I had the, the national curriculum at that time, so let's be honest, we're talking um, kind of late 1990s here. Uh, the national curriculum was quite um, detailed and it left relatively little room for you to have your own favourite text that you wanted to teach. It, it dictated or it seemed to dictate. I think the combination of, if I'm going to be completely fair, the combination of um, the exam syllabus and the national curriculum in combination meant there was very little wriggle room for you to have your own input into what to teach. And because I'd never known any different, I kind of made my peace with that because I had no real alternative. And then I moved to schools and at, I think, a, a different... I moved from the private sector into the state sector, so this has possibly got something to do with it. And suddenly I found that not only was I being told what to teach, but I was also being told how to teach. I was being told that my lessons needed to have a five-minute opener, followed by a 10-minute plenary, followed by a 15-minute group work activity. And it didn't matter what I was teaching. There was a certain model of how to construct a lesson. And not only that, there was this kind of weight of bureaucracy whereas, where I would before I would kind of close the classroom door and this seems like a terrible thing to admit nowadays but to me when I started my first job it was just the way it was you closed the door you had the books and the poems or whatever it was that you wanted to teach and you did whatever you wanted to do to teach those books 
suddenly I was expected to write all of this down and have all of these lesson plans written out showing how I was going to have this five minute plenary, this 10 minute group work exercise, blah, 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 and have it written down weeks in advance, committed to say if an Ofsted inspector happened to pass by randomly, I could show them these pages of paper. Anyway, the, um, the two, two lessons I take from this um, is that the shift from being told not just what to teach, but how to teach, shifted me in the direction to reinforce what you were saying, Nikos, about they are the establishment now. Um, my style had been, even with young children, fairly, I would say lecture, that's overstating it, fairly narrative, um, lots of talking, lots of getting them to read out extracts, to talk about the extracts. I was never a whiz-bang, flashy, kind of, let's all make collages type of teacher. You know, it was, was chalk and talk, um, and I'm proud of that. I genuinely think that was the best approach to teaching. Um, so when I was being told how to teach, what I was being told was, you have to be more like Robin Williams. Not quite, you have to stand on the table, but it almost felt as if that's what I was being told I had to do. Um, and that, well, basically that's why I left teaching. And I think it was the two things in combination. It was the kind of dead weight of bureaucracy that I found incredible. I did not want to spend two or three hours every day producing paperwork. I wanted to put my time and effort into actually being in the classroom and, and what I was doing and think through what I was actually doing with the students. And I, I just thought, if, if you're going to tell me what to teach and how to teach, there was no scope for me. Ironically, given I was being told to model um, the Robin Williams method, you know, there was no room for me as an individual in that. I could not express my personality. Uh, and obviously, I'm not saying for one second that teaching is all about me <laughs> or all about my personality but to go back to what we were saying earlier um, uh, the idea of it is a relationship it's a relationship between you and the students and knowledge it's a three-way relationship and if you are so um, curtailed that you cannot express your personality you go back to exactly what Gareth was saying this kind of cognitive science behavioral science kind of machine who's just kind of following diktats and it's it's so destroying and it's also pointless because no one's gaining or learning anything from it as far as I was concerned. So, so it's very biographical. So you <laughs> left teaching because of Robin Williams. Uh -huh, that's, <laughs> that's the moral of the story. I wouldn't want that for me. I have terrible recollection of books or films, which is a strange uh, confession for a literature teacher to make. I remember things in abstraction, not in, not in concrete, so I don't really remember the film. But didn't he also, wasn't he also su supposed to have a, a genuine enthusiasm for poetry? So that's yes. that's part of, uh, so that's getting mixed into, there's the, the formula for teaching and the rebelliousness, but there's also, he projected real passion. He was a good, right, so so that those things are getting mixed together, I think. Um, but I just wanted to say in regard to choice as the solution for student motivation, I am a literature teacher. I believe literature is an essential value to all human beings. I think, ideally, everyone would be brought through great classic literature as, as they're growing up. And even if they never pick up a book after that, it will have been formative of their souls in the process. Now, take the list of books that I teach to my seventh and eighth graders. I think almost none of them would make the choice for that to be part of their education were I not guiding them through it. And they, it's not that they're ma not making the choice because they don't want it. There is no way for them to know that they would want it in advance of me teaching them. So I have to, they need my guidance to go through it. They need me to, to uh, curate the list of works that are worth their while. They need me to model what it is to um, understand and relish the experience of reading. They need all that before they can know this is this is a potential value and a real value to them. So we seem to be obscuring over the whole difference between a child and an, ad and an adult these years and say, saying there's no, there essentially is no difference and we just need to, imp that we need to empower them with choices before they have the maturity or understanding to know what choices exist or what is out there, what is needed for them. So um, choice 
is not the solution. Yeah, we're in a we're in an era where your choices are inherently understood as oppressive. Mm -hmm. That's the problem we're in. That um, not just your choices, but the the act of discretion, the act of judgment drawing a line somewhere, drawing boundaries between things, which is, I think, essential to education, is seen as an oppressive act. Um, and this is a really, really deep-seated and, and huge problem, as, as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, not only that draw, drawing boundaries is oppressive, but that the whole thrust the, un the, the guiding philosophy, I think, of education, which I'm not sure has disappeared, even though we've moved in a, in a different way, perhaps, of, of teaching, but the, the, uh, the underpinning philosophy, I think, still remains, which is the, the deliberate collapsing of boundaries. So boundaries should be collapsed. The boundary between the adult and the child disappears. The boundaries between subjects disappear the boundaries within a subject. The subjects are not seen as things with boundaries at all. They're collapsed. You trying to reinsert them is an act of oppression. And I think until we really tackle that, it's largely rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, I think, because that, that philosophy is still there. Thank you. So I want to get to the audience. We haven't even touched on the issue of the culture wars and how they get engaged with education and all that stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one question from live audience, one question from our e-audience. Yeah, well, let's start with uh, the audience which are here. I think it's more considerate <laughs> and it's an act of justice. Yes. Uh, do we have a mic for the audience? No. <laughs> I'll, have to frame, I'll have to frame this as a question now. When I wasn't going to. I was going to try and make a contribution. So. Uh, right, listening to all that, there's just so much there that resonates, and I could talk for ages about things, but I just want to make two points. One is, the skills thing is, is a good example, actually. So you only have to think about, skills is just, in, in the educational context, skills is just bad writing. <laughs> because you only have to think about what skills means in, like, gymnastics, even soccer, and you would never use it in that way. And the relationship between when people talk about skills and the real world there's no relationship at all. You know, I've, I, I've changed from a teaching career into the real world. And believe me, there's no relationship at all. But this is the thing that I think really interested me about trying to draw this all together. I think it's the case of picking up what you were saying, Gareth, you know, arranging the deck chairs. We don't understand who the enemy is. And the enemy is the tech business. It is technology. You know, I left teaching 20 years ago when tech first raised its head. And everything I've seen since then is really about technology. And almost everything you've discussed, you could trace it back to a technological source somewhere. The investment that's carried out in, in educational technology in the last nine months, it's billions of dollars, billions of dollars in the ed tech sector. I've never seen anything like it. In fact, the best thing that's happened is recently the Chinese Communist Party have realized that this is really dangerous stuff. So they've reined it back enormously, and huge numbers of Chinese companies have just fallen through the floor. Uh, and that's where, the, that's where all of this comes from. The biggest, you know, the single biggest event in the UK that influences education, most teachers won't even know, it's called the Bet Show. It happens every year, you know, in the East End of London. It's massive, and it's all technology. And that's where it all comes from, and, and that's what I think we miss. We don't take the battle to where the battle should be. Oh, I, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid I've got to go first just because I work for an ed tech company. Yeah. Um, because, uh, I mean, the opportunity came along, but I thought exactly as, as you've just said, that th this is the battleground, or it's what, certainly one of the battlegrounds. I don't know if I'd agree that it, it all tracks back to technology. But what I think, you know, that's by the by, what I, what I think you're definitely on to is that the, that the people working in ed tech have a revolutionary zeal about them. They want to disrupt schools 
because they think they've got this amazing tool that is, is going to transform the world. And obviously, technology has transformed the world. It always does. Uh, so they, they argue from a strong position. Um, but I'm also, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't know if I ag agree that it's kind of wholly bad and we should cast it out. You know, I think there's a, there is a, a big debate to be had about that, but I'm going to pass the mic on. There's a line in the novel Shane, which is not unique to the novel Shane, but that's where I recall it, where he says, a gun is just a tool, only as good or only as bad as the man who uses it. And I think that's certainly true of technology. Now, there's, I, having said that, my school is a zero technology school. We have projectors in the classroom that the teachers can use on occasion when it's act actually helpful for the instruction. But the kids are writing with pencil and paper every day and they don't see a screen from the start to the end of school. Um, because the real learning happens in lectures, note taking, and writing. And that's, that's, and there's so much about using technology that can lend itself to sound bite, short range, not depth and sus not deep sustained thinking. So it, tech is a threat as, as it's used in the classrooms, I think, but I think there are many places for it if we understood what real learning actually is. No, it's interesting to hear Lisa say that about her school and um, people who've been following the University of Austin will have read that one of the selling points of that new university is, um, I can't, you, you know his name, don't you? The guy who's going to be, uh, the yes, that's right, thank you, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> Sorry if that's a microaggression then forgetting his name there. <laughs> I did, I did, it's just his name, I've forgotten. I remember how inspiring. Yes, that's right. Um, and he's made the point that the University of Austin will have as few screens, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but he says, you know, as few screens as, as necessary or as few screens as possible. And I think the reason why he can say that about the University of Austin and the reason why Lisa can confidently say that about her school is because these are educational institutions that have a very strong sense of moral purpose and a, well, a strong sense of purpose full stop of what they're doing in relation to knowledge, in relation to books, in relation to knowledge and I think when you've got that deep-rooted commitment and, and deep sense of purpose of what you're doing in relation to knowledge in a way you you can take or leave the technology exactly as you say it's either a useful tool or it's not a useful tool so I do agree with you Joe. Um, I think it's true that technology can have a real dire effect on the classroom but I think in a way it's a, a symptom of a much bigger problem which was there first and the bigger problem is this hollowing out of a sense of moral purpose in relation to education and I think schools kind of hit that point first it's like you create this vacuum, uh, moral vacuum, in the sense of what are we doing and why are we here? And, and then when you have that vacuum, you then look for something to mask the fact that that vacuum exists in the first place. You And at that point then, having all these kind of shiny, gimmicky things come along and say, look, we can um, teach for you, we can entertain you, we can do everything for you, becomes a very attractive um, prospect. Of course, you're absolutely right. The whole thing becomes this then vicious circle of the more there's the tech, there's less, there's the need for teachers to come up with a moral purpose as to what they're doing and the tech becomes an end in and of itself. Um, but I think, I think you're right, but I think we need to understand the order in which these things happened. I don't think teachers were kind of doing a really fantastic job with a very strong sense of purpose and then tech came in and said, oi, bugger off. I think there was the crisis in purpose first of all and then tech came in to kind of fill that gap would be my read of the situation. Thank you. So let's go now to online questions. Super. Right. So <clears throat> we have a, a bunch of super chats. Uh, Jonathan with a very generous super chat says in support of Lisa. Uh, Jonathan with another super chat says if you have kids, where else would you send them besides Laporte or Van Damme? Uh, I don't know if anybody actually has an answer for that or if that was just a rhetorical question. Uh, Mary Aline sends a super chat with an emoji that I won't attempt to describe, but it's, it's something positive. Uh, and Chris, uh, with a super chat, asks, 
Uh, how to integrate this topic with a burgeoning philosophy for children movement. Compelling evidence indicates that children as young as about six can handle philosophical material. I would want clarification on the question. What does it mean to teach philosophy to a six-year-old? I mean, in a sense, philosophy enters every aspect of life at every stage of development, but that would be different from sitting a child down and lecturing them abstractly on epistemology or teaching them about the difference between Plato and Aristotle. So um, I, I think philosophy abstractly as a subject, as an intellectual discipline, needs to come after you learn an awful lot about the world. <laughs> and so the idea of introducing philosophy abstractly as a subject before they've studied history, seen on a grand scale what the consequences are of certain ideas in action, um, before they've had lots of interpersonal experiences, with people that they can maturely process before they've read great works of literature and seen sort of sub-themes of philosophy as they come out through, through the concretization in plays and novels. All of these things are experiences and, and uh, parts of knowledge that they would need, I think, before they could possibly study philosophy abstractly. No, I, I completely agree. Uh, to me, the philosophy in schools movement is is very much like the advocates of teaching critical thinking. Um, of course, I'm not remotely opposed to children learning um, how to think critically, and I'm not opposed at all to children learning how to think philosophically. But the question I always come back to when people talk about critical thinking is critical thinking about what? You know, you can't... I don't see how you can teach crit just critical thinking in the abstract. You need to teach people how to think critically about something Thing. And so that obviously requires the something there, first of all. Um, but I actually have a much bigger concern about the philosophy in schools movement. Um, and that's uh, something we haven't touched upon this evening. I don't know if you want to go down this line or not, but I'm, um, I have a big concern about the uh, kind of, I, I want to say kind of therapeuticization. And I know that's not a word, but the, the kind of way that schools take on this therapeutic role in relation to children. And I think this has been hugely ramped up post-pandemic. Um, and yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but, but I guess my concern is that philosophy in schools becomes a kind of extension of circle time of sit down and tell us how you're feeling today and tell us what's troubling you. And maybe I'm being very, very cynical and misunderstanding it. I'm sure it's far more like the um, critical thinking type of things. But I do think this perception of, of children, and this is the broader point, I guess, that we've not really talked about, the perception of children as being very mentally fragile, mentally vulnerable nowadays, is an incredibly negative, um, has a very negative impact upon education um, most broadly. So, I mean, just to give a couple of concrete examples, we can see obviously children's education was very severely disrupted around the pandemic and still is, sadly, I think, being disrupted. Um, and there's no, no getting over that fact. So the, the question is then, what do you do about it? And um, we've seen the um, exam boards cutting syllabus content. Um, so again, it really feeds into this instrumentalization and the teaching to the test that we talked about, but this is being done under the name of uh, kind of protecting vulnerable children who might have to confront something they haven't been formally taught in a classroom or kind of promoting this parity um, for some children who've had good experiences and some children who've had less positive experiences during lockdown, but rather than having the expectation that we level up and we try and compensate to bring all children up to the same high standard, the assumption is we just cut the curriculum across the board. And then there was another bizarre discussion, I don't know if you picked up on it, Gareth, um, probably about this time last week. Um, it's one of those 
points where you listen to the radio in the morning and you think, did I really hear that? A kind of lengthy, angst-ridden discussion about the order of questions on GCSE exam papers and how um, examiners should be very careful in the order in which they pose the questions. Because if you have a difficult question at the beginning, a child's confidence might be so completely dashed, they can't then cope with easier questions if they appear later in the paper. So the idea that you put all the kind of easy questions at the beginning, not for any kind of pedagogical reason that you might kind of help children construct some sense of the knowledge area they're working in before building up to something more challenging, but purely because of a therapeutic impact of you kind of allow the students to uh, boost their self-esteem by answering some of the easy questions first, so then they're all kind of self-esteem loaded in order to answer the more complex questions. And so that's a very, very long rambling answer to the question about philosophy, but yeah, I'm concerned it just becomes a critical thinking in the abstract, pointless exercise, and I'm also concerned it becomes an excuse for a kind of group therapy kind of circle time activity. Yeah, I can hear enormous numbers of philosophy for children exponents shouting at this because they're probably saying, no, but that's exactly why it exists, you know, to show how you can teach philosophy to these young children. And no, no, Joanna Williams, it's not about that at all, you know. Um, so the observation I'll make is that I've, I've seen it done actually early on in its existence. I've seen it done really well. I've seen it done really, really badly. And, and the, the number of times it's been done well is very small compared to a, a, a lot of it being done really badly that I've seen. And the, and the main reason is, and Joan has been alluding to that, it's not really philosophy. It's not actually philosophy. And, and I just say, why isn't it philosophy? Because the people that are delivering this stuff in the main have absolutely no interest in philosophy. Um, and I think that's really how it lives and uh, lives and dies actually that philosophy for children is going to be good if the people who are delivering it are interested in philosophy but so many of our teachers are more interested in or, or actually think that philosophy is something to do with self-esteem or whatever so the circle thing i totally circle time thing i i, I totally agree with you um joe and see, seeing as going off the topic again seeing as you mentioned the pandemic i was just going to fill in my observation that masks, the whole thing about masks in schools, and this is not a debate about how effective masks may or may not be, but I was just so disappointed that so few teachers, when the masks discussion was going on, were making the points that we were making about that crucial thing about eye contact, and not just eye contact, but seeing how a student answers something, the way they may be searching for words, whether they're just sitting you know half of that disappears in a masked room and maybe you think well we do need masks but the fact that the discussion was never had about this fundamentally changes what education's like you can't just do this and then think that school is going to carry on as it was is is another instance of of a debate that's just not had yet seems to me to be absolutely central to the business of education uh, and the mystery that i cannot solve is I see teachers wearing a mask in class, which I respect everyone, you know, has different and there are windows, and the windows are closed. So the question is, are you doing it? I mean, I totally respect people who are concerned with the virus, totally. But if you're concerned, the low-hanging fruit is open the window. So you have a mask, which is also one of the crappy ones, not the ones that work. So what's the... Anyway. One, two, and then... Actually, one. Super chat, one. So my question is about uh, responsibility. Do, do we put the responsibility on the right person when we are talking about teachers and students? So for example, the, are, are teachers in a classroom are there to just teach and it's, it's just their responsibility to teach or is it the student's responsibility to learn? Because as, as far as I've listened to you you, you, you are talking about the teacher's perspective, but what about the student's perspective? And if this teacher has the responsibility, uh, is it should it should it should should it not be the, should it not be their their choice to have their like uh, the, the structure for the class 
uh, or even even the longer uh, lesson duration uh, rather than just the standard one hour or two hour or whatever the standard is. So it, should it be a choice for the teacher to have the thing or is it the teacher's responsibility to teach and not the students? That's a great question and quite often when I see students on their phone, I wonder, my first reaction is it's on me. I did something wrong. But then when you are in an educational culture where this is the norm that I'm gonna be on Tinder and on Facebook during class, like what, what, yeah, what, what is the share of the responsibility between the student on the phone and the teacher who maybe doesn't make it as interesting as for the student to leave the phone? Um, so there was, there was a, a horrible, iniquitous bit of the how to teach guidance that used to be given out. It's probably still given out that, um, you know, I'm, I'm a new teacher. I'm having trouble with the, the, the boys at the back who are, you know, not paying attention. And then being told, well, that's because your lessons aren't interesting enough. You know, that is a horrible, any sort of trainee teacher that's told that doesn't know where to go with that information. It's quite widely held, that view. Um, so leaving that aside, um, you know, actually, I think, I think the responsibility to educate is, is a social thing. So it's actually held by a whole range of, 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 of actors in, in this, um, both in the home, as we've spoken about, and in the school. But let's just restrict it to the classroom. The, the teacher absolutely, you know, it doesn't... If we're talking about our own children, you know, my my sons are sort of, you know, quite well well adjusted kids, and they like readings, and they and they and they're, you know, nice model students. I mean, I wish they'd kick up a bit more, to be honest, and be a bit more revolutionary. But they're, you know, they're good kids, and so we always tend to get good reports from them, and that's fine. But those children are really, really easy to teach. So really, where a teacher is testing their metal is to get those very, very difficult characters who are completely disaffected by your subject and probably by you as well. And you have a responsibility. You cannot give up on them. You have to say, there is something here that I can break through to. And if you're not doing that, and it drives you crazy, but if you're not doing that, personally, I think you're not trying hard enough. And it's very, very difficult, and I don't underestimate it. So there is um, a, a responsibility there. But I... Crucially, and um, I'm trying to remember that, um, can somebody help me out? Who's the one of the early sociologists came up with sacred and profane knowledge? And, and so No, no, no. Um, uh, you know, back... Uh, no, but around that time. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, his name will come back to me in the middle of the night. Um, he was talking about the, the desire for learning. That no, was before, it was long before Bernstein. Sorry, Jay. Um, he, he said that it was absolutely essential. S say again? Durkheim. That's who it was. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. That PhD did you some good, didn't it? Um, Durkheim talks about the desire for learning. And, and basically, you know, being very simplistic here, but he, he kind of says, without that, education's not going to get going. And that's kind of the situation we're in, actually, where we can, you can take a child to water and get them to pass the exam, but have you put that desire for learning there? And actually, the desire for learning begins before they in, enter the classroom. So that a teacher can only do so much, and they must never give up on the, you know, they must never say, it can't be done. But at the same time, that desire for learning has to be there. That's the job of society, and that's one of the things we have to tackle, you know, together, is how do we switch our kids back on to intellectual learning and thought because I think we're in danger of switching them off from that, the more instrumental we make it. It's very difficult for me to answer this question because I often feel somewhat invincible. <laughs> and I think my invincibility does come in part because I own my own private school. I attract families who take education very seriously. Um, and I just... And I believe very passionately in the value of my subject to every individual human being. So all I have to do is translate from me to them the actual, earnest, genuine value of the subject that I'm teaching them. So it's, it's a 
if I can, it's a pretty simple formula. Now, that said, I do have those conditions in place that make them ready and easily reachable. So, but I do want to go into a classroom where kids are completely jaded and utterly turned off from education and try my hand there because I feel like I would be able to <laughs> succeed in that situation too um, because I just, uh, my husband has described in other contexts the idea of when you actually have somebody, something important to communicate to someone that they might be resistant to or antagonistic to, the feeling should be that you're handing them $100 bills. Do you realize, do, not that you're fighting and battling against them, but just you're showing them, I have this amazing thing to offer to you. And that's how I, I feel when I'm teaching literature is that I'm handing them $100 bills. Um, that doesn't mean every one of my students sits there riveted and grateful through every one of my lectures and adores every book that we read, but uh, so it's going to, the, the impact is going to exist on a spectrum, but I, I do feel a sense of success with everybody that I teach, whatever amount of progress I'm, I'm able to make with them. And then I do understand that given a lot of people's educational experiences, there can be a big hurdle to convincing them that going through sustained intellectual effort is going to produce any kind of, of value or outcome for them that they feel as satisfying and fulfilling in a really personal way. I understand that that's a challenge, um, but that's a challenge that comes, you know, as a result of preconditions when the student comes to me, it's, and that's that can be a difficult, I don't, it, that can be a problem that I can't solve. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question that you ask about responsibility and whether the responsibility is teachers or students, and um, to give a bit of a cop-out answer, I don't think there's, there's I don't think there is an, it is, it's not an either or. I don't think you can say that. And I don't even think you can come up with some, I, th I think there's a process of maturation um, for each individual child. Um, and by that, I don't mean biological maturation, but intellectual maturation, which is going to happen in every child at a different stage and not only every child at a different stage, but every child at a different stage in every subject. Um, so a child might be kind of quite intellectually mature in history, for example, and inspired to go off and try and read more and find out more for themselves, but very intellectually immature in maths and need the teacher to play a much more didactic role in imparting knowledge and inspiring. So then this is where I think what I'm saying really chimes in with what Lisa and Gareth have said, because I guess what the process of education is about in part is creating the conditions for that intellectual maturation process so that the children can become intellectually mature enough and my guess is it probably wouldn't even happen in childhood at all but you're looking in the early years of, of actually of, of higher education the point at which um, a child can become a student, can become intellectually mature enough to want to take responsibility, and not just to want to take responsibility, but to be able to take responsibility. But uh, even then, I don't think that's the end of the responsibility of the teacher. It just marks a shift in what the, the nature of the teacher's responsibility is. So clearly in the primary years and the early years of secondary education, the teacher's having to play a much more straightforward didactic role in actually if I don't tell the children or show very demonstrably to these children what it is they need to know, um, then they will not know it. Whereas um, I think teachers of more intellectually mature children and students still have a responsibility, but the responsibility is much more about inspiring, leading, giving direction, and providing intellectual opportunities um, in the kind of truest sense. So I'm not just saying, oh, there's a library over there, but, but this is where your lectures, um, your reading material, and actually giving advice about good re reading material um, comes in because that can help the processes. So you've got somebody hopefully by that stage who is wanting to be um, in, responsible for their own intellectual development but is still looking for the mentorship, um, which Lisa was talking about earlier, to actually lead and guide. So it's still a responsibility, it's just a different type of responsibility. It just occurred to me, consistent with what you've said, that at my school, where we have students from five to 14, about 14 years old, 
it's not until they're in seventh and eighth grade, 13, 14, that we give grades at all. There are no grades until that point. And that's a reflection of the fact that we do regard them as not mature enough that it's appropriate to just evaluate the first product that we that they submit to us. We think it's a nurturing back and forth, continually motivating them, continually giving them feedback, and that's more the dynamic of it. It's not until, by the time they get to my classes when they're 13 and 14, they do have more of a sense of personal responsibility and, and individual investment in what they're doing. And at that point, it seems more appropriate to give them grades. Finally, something we disagree on. <laughs> Let's see where we are with the online audience. Uh, yeah, so we have a bunch of super chats, and we will get to all the super chats we have now, but we are coming towards the end of the event, so if anybody uh, has any more questions, please send them uh, in the next few minutes. All right, and uh, so Helio sends a what I believe is a foam finger emoji, uh, and also shows that you can be uh, in the in-person audience and send a super chat at the same time, so uh, thanks. I, I won't say his real name because I guess he uh, chooses uh, that name for a reason. Grant uh, sends um, uh, a super chat saying, thank you for hosting and regret I could not attend. I was looking forward to being there and meeting Lisa. Thank you, ARC UK. And Mary Aileen uh, asks, I think Less Than Words Can Say by Richard Mitchell, Mitchell is a brilliant book. Do you agree with any of his ideas uh, about what is wrong with education? All right, so we, we might get through all the, the questions, including additional ones. Uh, Landon asks, are... Um, are classical schools a reasonable alternative to public? And uh, how do you supplement the education of a child in, uh, in these schools to avoid intrinsicism? Uh, by the way, this is a, I see that it's a US dollar question, so by public he means government schools. Could it be something like what we have here with uh, Catherine Birbal, so which is a school with very uh, traditional principles, for example, she doesn't allow cell phones, and it's a school with excellent results, and it's a school that definitely triggers the educational establishment. So that would be the equivalent in the UK context. I'm really sorry, Razi, I'm just not completely, even with that explanation, I'm not really sure. So it's about the difference between private, no, not between private, but, but between traditional it's and... To a more traditional, so, I think what they're asking is your daughter's school, you know, the, the mm, I guess the grammar, grammar school yeah. um, Is that preferable to the other al alternatives? And then, I, and then they're asking, how do you fight against the rationalism? So rationalism, as he's using it, um, means just ideas that kind of trump the rules. Trump rules. Mm. Well, that's the rules of the society that you like. So basically, you don't follow, but you follow your mind has some rules, and you have to follow these rules. Mm -hmm. So, okay, my attempt at answering this question then. I think um, in this country we get way too bogged down with the type of school and the, the structure of a school and the nature of a school. And I think not, I don't think that's unimportant, but I think far more important is just what happens inside the school and inside the classroom. And, you know, in some ways, Maybe I'm being incredibly glib here, but you wouldn't want children almost to know whether their parents were paying for the school or whether they'd passed a selection test. 
you know, you want children to just have a really great educational experience and it should be entirely irrelevant um, whether uh, the state has paid for that or from the child's perspective, it should be entirely irrelevant whether the state has paid for that or um, their parents have paid for it. I mean, I, I guess what um, private schools have in terms of an advantage over publicly funded schools is um, more freedom. Um, to be able to set their own um, curriculum, to, to go off in the direction they want. In terms of, of kind of traditional schools, you know, there's traditional and traditional. Again, I know I'm giving really trite, I'm embarrassed by my own answers to these questions, <laughs> but, you know, there's traditional and traditional. I think, again, um, if it's traditional for a purpose, because we have a strong set of values and our values are centred around knowledge, I'm also sounding like a stuck record here, then, and the traditional ethos is feeding into that moral purpose, then that's one thing. But if it's just, you know, we want to be traditional, so we're going to come up with this whole heap of rules that we expect you all to follow. And we don't really have a deep moral purpose that's justifying and driving those rules. I think children can learn some quite um, perverse lessons about obedience and compliance, um, which can be quite counterproductive. It's, it's, again, it's not driven by a sense of, of purpose. It, it is just instilling a, an almost kind of military style of obedience for no other end other than it's it's becomes discipline in, in and of itself would be would be my fear <laughs> I'll just say that when parents ask me what type of school they should send their child to if they can't come to Van Dam Academy um, or uh, how to evaluate a school I always say put aside the type it tells you almost nothing. Just for example, the name Montessori is in the public domain. Any school can slap the name Montessori. It, mean, it does not at all indicate that they're um, aligned with the traditional Montessori curriculum, nor that that's going to make it a good school, even if they were. So what I recommend that people do is be as obnoxiously present as you possibly can inside the walls of that school before you choose it for your child. A lot of schools are resistant to having parents spend time inside the classrooms, but I just recommend that, that parents spend as much time as they possibly can watching the dynamic between teachers and students, watching the uh, reaction of the students to the lessons, watching the content of the classes, and getting a sense of whether this strikes them as the sort of place they want their child to spend their day. And I just don't think there's any substitute because there might be, quote, classical schools that are better than average. There might be progressive schools that are better than average. It's all going to depend on what's actually happening inside those walls. Yeah, I, I guess I, I think it is more important than you b both may be suggesting that the the way schools come about and how they're managed and how they're run and i i wouldn't i wouldn't just say it doesn't really matter you know the, the important thing is what's going on inside or of course that is the most important thing um but just on um just on the tradition thing you know going back to what i said about the kind of move to collapse boundaries i think there's a, there's been a, a backlash to that if you like a reaction to it which is to reassert boundaries and, and to really be very forceful about that. And there's a place for that in, in a situation where boundaries are considered to um, be a really, really bad thing. Uh, but I think it's absolutely key to the, you know, good education that uh, this process of asserting boundaries and then allowing the transgression of those boundaries. And I'm talking about in terms of the subject, you know, b breaking the boundaries of the subject, working out how, how new knowledge is going to come through, but also socially and everything else. And, and every, you know, head teacher worth their salt, I think, um, has to deal with the rebel in their midst and what that's all about. Do you want to just create loads of conformists or do you also want to create revolutionaries? And if you want to create revolutionaries, they are going to start by saying, well, I'm not going to wear my tie like that. You know, I'm going to have a crazy haircut. And then you have to say, well, are you just going to clamp down on them? Are you going to say, 
that's not allowed? Um, or are you going to try and work with that person? And, and how? You know, and these are very, really complex situations. But also in terms of education, and, and you know, I, I think it, it's really, really easy to just go back to tradition and say, let's teach just the great books. Let's just teach the subjects as we've all understood them. Um, I think experimentation is good. I think transgressing boundaries is good, but you have to have a very clear understanding of where the boundaries are before you try to transgress them. Good point. Razi, uh, actually, let's go to Daryl. Yeah. A teacher in his own way. Um, hi. Uh, so I, <laughs> I have lots of questions, but I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to pick one. So. Um, my question uh, that I think is my favorite is, uh, I'd love to know from you guys what you consider a great education is in the, quite a broad sense, and then what you think the fundamentals are to, to creating the conditions for someone to have a great education. So what does that uh, actually look like in terms of the different things that they need to make that, that happen? Does that make sense? So it's a really huge question that you're throwing at us right at the end here. Um, so um, I think I would want children to have some sense of their intellectual birthright, um, their intellectual inheritance, some, be able to gain from it some sense of where they fit into the world intellectually. So that would... I think this does involve tradition. It does involve um, a canon. Um, it, it should have some sense of the best that's been thought and said. And I think this is a conversation for teachers. I, I think the most important question for teachers is what to teach. Um, sifting through all the knowledge in the world and identifying what is it exactly that humanity has learnt in over 2,000 years of existence, three, 4,000 years of existence, that we think is sufficiently important, that we think our children deserve to know. And I think it, you can look at that across a range of different subject areas. You know, what are the best literary texts? Um, what, what, which poems are the most beautiful, um, which, um, yeah, again, I think you would do that across a range of different subject areas, but you're looking at, at what's, what are the most important things that we've learned as a, a human species. I know I'm giving a really kind of grand answer to this question. Um, and I think, I think there's not one answer for all time to these questions. These are going to be changing um, answers, the answers that, that, that are going to change over time and change, change in context. But I think having access to that body of knowledge gives you some sense of your place in the world that, that doesn't put you at the center of it. Another thing we've been talking about today, it doesn't put you at the center, which I think so much of education does, but it allows you to know properly um, the, the how you stand in relation almost to the rest of humanity and in relation to human history. Um, and I, I think the way that we do this is, is largely things that we've already spoken about this evening, introducing children to literature, introducing children to um, great works of art, of music, the best that we have to offer in our culture and really getting them to think and engage and, and struggle to master these things. And I think th there's almost a certain order to that. You almost want children to be able to fall in love with literature, art, music, fall in love with these things just in and of themselves, and then begin to move on to think critically about why do they love it? Why might some people not love it? What, what might be good? What might be bad about it? I think we rush too much to the final stage of that um, without getting children to fall in love with their intellectual inheritance, first of all. I, want, I would go back to the term I mentioned before of intellectual disciplines. I feel like it's my job as a... in in my capacity as owner of a school 
that collectively we are passing on the legacy of wisdom um, from the ages. So I agree with Joanna completely. There's a legacy of wisdom. We don't want to throw these kids to the wolves, make them recreate the wheel um, in the name of giving them choice and agency. Just say, you go figure it all out yourself. There are, we have a, a long history of geniuses and great minds who have given us such deep understanding of the world in all sorts of different capacities. So the intellectual disciplines, Arthur Bester, when he introduces that term, says they're not, this is not a settled list of disciplines. This could shift and change over time as we discover new knowledge, but there's a reason we have a subject of science. There's a reason we have a subject of history and of literature and of math. They're not, they're not just arbitrary divisions. They're unique ways of mastering and understanding the world. And I would want a student in, over the course of their education to develop a, the most competency they can in each of those uh, in each of those disciplines, in each of those approaches to looking at and understanding the world. So of course it's easiest for me to speak to in regard to literature because that's my subject area and I would want teachers who uh, have the same depth of understanding and, and feeling of importance and moral purpose to their subject areas. Um, but in literature, there is, literature is has a unique ability to take abstract ideas and make them powerfully and dramatically and emotionally concretized for students. So they're sort of seeing abstract ideas in practice. I sometimes, I sometimes like to think of literature, the experience of mastering and understanding great literature as if I had special glasses that I could put on right now, look around the room and see only what is essential to this moment um, and have everything streamlined to that purpose. And literature both does that in the, it, if, if it's great literature, does that within the universe of the work itself, but it also empowers you to be able to look at that, the world in that manner, to look out at complexity and see an essence and see your values in all the chaos of the world around you. So that's a, I have to do that very quickly, but, but the idea is there is, and also in doing that, I'm drawing upon people who have the power to observe and understand and be passionate about the world to a much greater capacity than I myself am. Every time I read a new chapter of uh, Les Miserables and Victor Hugo, I have a new, deeper, stretched, improved understanding of why life matters. Um, so the, if, uh, if we take each of these subjects and define the purpose of each and understand what's so important about this as an intellectual legacy and then pass that on to our kids, then I think we've successfully educated them. Oh, wow. I mean, follow, follow those two. That's why I was writing things down, because I knew that I would get so caught up in what you two were saying that I'd forget what I wanted to say. So, um, as has been mentioned, okay, so what, um, what is a good education? I, I think, it, simply put for me, it's, it is the development of intellect. Whatever you, you think an intellect is, and, you know, there's no greed definition, but... Whatever you think it is, it's the development of that. Um, but also, I think it's, it's leading a child to understand that what I would call the social nature of knowledge. This is, this is a collective, you know, it's the thing you've been talking about, the, the sort of store of, of, of humanity, the, the intellectual heritage. The, and and it, within that is the idea that, that this, in a way, is something made by humans, but it, it extends beyond that. It's not entirely constructed, it's also found... Um, so that obviously means an understanding of the canon, but what I was saying before, you know, where the gaps and the errors in that canon are. Um, you know, the effect of colonialism on literature, you know, that's something that is expanding outwards. Um, I think it's important to realise that education is inherently a conservative activity because you are passing on and trying to conserve something, but has to be quite radical and revolutionary as well. And squaring that circle is, 
is very difficult sometimes. Um, what is actually needed, a te you know, a teacher in love with their subject in a room with students, plural. Not a tutor, but a teacher. Again, it's a social activity. Um, and that's, that can really take you a very, very long way if the teacher is in love with their um, subject. Um, but crucially, access to a good library. And that's becoming really difficult these days, especially in schools. Not a, not a learning resource centre. I mean, a library with proper books in it. Um, and then, you know, challenge and disruption has to be a really important part of, of education. It's got to disturb the student the, the older they get. I think they just have to be, to a certain extent, threatened by knowledge. And that's a problem that we have encountered a lot in contemporary times. So I, 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 to, to finish, I, I said this a little while ago, but I think for me, this sums everything up that I believe about education, which is that if you can, if you can by the time they leave school, if a, maths, a naturally sort of maths geek knows how to plane a block of wood and a hairdresser understands Hamlet's soliloquy and both of those parties know why all of that is important, then I think you've educated properly, in my book anyway. Thank you very much, Gary. So we are reaching uh, the... Uh, what we Okay, and you have a, have we got five more minutes? Okay, how about one minute and one minute, and then we have a final uh, wrap up. So first of all, I would probably conf I mean, confirm I'm fully with you guys with the idealistic view, but I think we should not be naive and challenge ourselves. I, li I work in a company which I would describe as a knowledge company, yet, probably the skilled and the social agile make a better career than the ones purely living the dream that we describe. And if we all say education is about doing a service to that individual, is our ideal of a service really the right ideal? Or is preparing them for a society that is different from this ideal more and more, because that's partly what you described a couple of times, Garrett, is that not more our duty? It's just a challenge. I'm not disagreeing with your views. But we have to be intellectually honest to ourselves. So we get the super chat, uh, some housekeeping, and then 30 seconds each as a goodbye parting words. <laughs> and of course, I'm ready uh, with this. Uh, well, actually, we have a few super chats. So Marilyn says, thanks. Uh, Robert Nacer says, purpose, passion, and mastery. Outstanding. And uh, Duncan asks, Thoughts on length of school day and frequency of schedule uh, of classes for high schoolers? All day block schedule was a disaster for my kids. So, okay, so we're gonna get to the panel for the final thought. Just let me say in terms of, so if you liked what Joanna said, she has written a book in 2013, Consumed, am I not? Consuming Higher Education, Why Learning Can Be Bought. So you might think this doesn't sound very kind of free, free but don't be, don't be fooled by the title. You will find value to this book no matter what your take is on. Uh, I, was, I was thinking about it because it was the first book on education that really got me to think about, uh, these, uh, about these issues. So 30 seconds each, no pressure. So if I've understood your question correctly, it's about preparing children for society. And I think it's a really good question because I think it does tie in so many of the different things that we've talked about, um, in particular something that I think Gareth was talking about right at the beginning, about the um, role of school as just kind of one small part, really, of a child's life. And um, Nikos raised as well the, the interaction between and the relationship between schools, parents, teachers. Uh, children come into contact with a whole lot of people. And I think the question that you're asking perhaps wouldn't have been asked 20 or 30 years ago um, when there were considered to be many other ways of children being prepared for society other than through the school. 
So even when I was yeah, when I was a child, uh, it wasn't uncommon for children to have Saturday jobs, to um, have paper rounds, and I guess what prepared me for the workplace and what gave me social skills um, that I've employed in workplace was no lesson, um, formal lesson in how to be prepared for society. It wasn't even anything that happened, I would say, with my schooling, although there is clearly a socialization role of schools, but it was experience of being in society that taught me how to cope in society. And I think, obviously, we've all talked at length this evening, rightly, about the very valuable rule, uh, role that schools play uh, in relation to individual children, children collectively, and society at large. Um, but I think it's perhaps beholden upon us also to remember the points about a broader culture um, which we're all operating in, our schools are operating in, our children are living in, and we're all existing as parents and teachers in, of which schools are only one small part of that. And, you know, a, a personal gripe of mine, I, 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 maybe you know this, Gareth, I don't, but, but some group, I think, kind of calculated up the number of different social problems where the answer is put it on the curriculum, get teachers to do it. So everything from kind of childhood obesity um, to children not getting enough exercise to bad manners everything, you know, put it on the curriculum, put it on the curriculum. And the, the problem, of course, is if teachers do all of these 123 other things, teach them about money, teach them how to open a bank account, you squeeze out, not only do you squeeze out the role of actually teaching subjects, but squeeze out the time for it, but you dilute the moral value of what you're doing because it becomes teaching a, a work of literature becomes just one thing among many of also, so I'm going to teach you how to open a bank account, now I'm going to teach you about literature. And obviously they're not morally equivalent, but in the eyes of children, the, the danger is they come to be seen as morally equivalent things. Can you give me one example of what it would mean to prepare them for the world? or prepare them for society as opposed to what we're doing in schools? What, what would be an example of preparing the child for society? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. <laughs> mm. Okay. Right, but does everybody, does it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it, it's really difficult to answer this briefly because I feel like a lot of things are being con conflated. So I don't think everybody needs to be an extrovert. I think that is a fundamental principle of education today. No, I know you're not saying that, but I think a lot of schools put a premium on the child being outspoken, having strong opinions, being very social, being capable of working in groups, and I just, that is not a goal I have for education. And in fact, a disservice to them. But does society, do, but does society put a premium on that for positive reasons? If not, then there's no reason to prepare them for that. So what I what I want, okay, I just so I think the best way to prepare children for 
all scenarios in life is to develop their intellect, to give them the power to think. So if you come into a situation where you observe that in this situation, it would be preferable for me to develop my ability to, um, to persuade and to, uh, to you know, operate in this more social setting, capacity and all these various intellectual disciplines. Now, I will tell you that mo I, I believe that most employers, when they're looking at an, a, an array of applicants, they're the mature, serious, clear thinker with depth of soul is going to win out in that scenario almost every time because they're, they're, that's people may not have the, the language and the terminology to describe that, but that's what there's a premium on because it's so desperately hard to find people with that capacity. So I want to... That was some of the longest 30 seconds I think I've ever heard, so I better be really quick. Um, when I, I think I consider myself really lucky. I had a really good education when I was a kid, and on day one when we turned up, all sat in the hall, they gave us a copy of a poem called If by Rudyard Kipling, right? Indeed, and, <laughs> and I think that that uh, summed the whole thing up. And so if you're looking for what a school should do, it's contained in if. You have to take it seriously. You know, it talks about talking with kings. If you're going to talk with kings, you need to know a lot of history. You know, so it's not an anti-knowledge thing at all. If by Rudyard Kipling. And, and a great deal of that is socialization. And, and I, it's such a shame we got to that question because I disagreed with virtually everything these two ladies said right at the end. But we we're out of time. First of all, a big thank you to you who are here, a big thank you to our e audience. So I already said for Joanna, I think follow her on Spiked, her books, but particularly the education books. So Lisa, as you know, perhaps if you follow the channel, has a parenting show every Thursday at this time where the event started based on where you are in the world. So two hours from now going back, seven o'clock UK time. And Gareth, I think you're in the Academy of Addis Education Forum where there are also many interesting discussions around education. So, uh, many thanks. Thanks to... I need to push this. Quick, quick. <laughs> you can also read me on Spiked, by the way. You're not the only one. Um, but, but, but I'm also in a book out there. And seeing as this was called something like What Should Children Know? And, my, and the book I'm in is called What Should Schools Teach? That's the one you should buy before you buy Joe's. You know. But buy Joe's as well. It's very good. We have people who have written nice things. That's the, the takeaway. So thank you very much. Thanks, Raj, for organizing and all the best.